morning. Welcome, everyone. Thank you uh, for attending a virtual tour of our San Jose Creek Water Reclamation Plan. Uh, because of COVID situation, we've moved our public tours to the Zoom platform. We usually have about 200 people visit our lovely treatment plant once or twice a year on a Saturday but we've moved to this platform and hopefully you enjoy this experience. And this morning I have Genesis Rodriguez with me. She'll be moderating this, fielding your questions um, through the Zoom feature. Uh, Genesis is a public affairs specialist with the sanitation districts. And I'm Basil Hewitt, I'm an engineer with the sanitation districts. So let's get on with this tour and hopefully it's as interesting and as entertaining as walking through a treatment plant. So the sanitation districts, we were formed in 1923. Uh, and the major environmental issue was raw sewage. Raw sewage was going into our beaches like Venice Beach, Santa Monica, Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach. Um, and you can see an actual shot of what um, Santa Monica Bay looked like, South Bay looked like. <clears throat> and that led to, because of raw sewage going into the beach, uh, into the ocean and our rivers, life expectancy in LA County back in the early 1920s was about 50 to 55 years of age on average. So the people, uh, especially the South Bay, got together um, with their local legislator and they passed the law in Sacramento that created our agency called the Sanitation Districts Act. So we were formed in 1923 to collect and treat sewage to protect our local waterways. So we were formed in 23 and our first facility, our first treatment plant, our largest treatment plant came online in 1928. And that's the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant that you see here, if you see my cursor. It's right off the 110 freeway at Sepulveda. As you drive north on the 110, as you get to Sepulveda, you will look to, look to your right and this is the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant. It now occupies about 400 um, acres of land and it treats sewage for about 5 million people. So that plant was built in 28, uh, built in 20, and then by 1937, we did something that was even further groundbreaking or innovative. We built a tunnel from that treatment plant, an eight foot diameter tunnel that was about six miles in length and it went all the way out to the ocean. Um, and then it tied into ocean outfalls, which are basically pipes that sit at the bottom of the ocean. And our, as uh, population of LA County continued to grow and more sewage came to our door, we built a second tunnel in 1958, 12 foot in diameter. And again, it, it went all the way to San Pedro um, and it tied into ocean outfalls. And what does an ocean outfall look like? It basically is a, a pretty good animation of it. It's pipes sitting at the bottom of the ocean. So the two tunnels, which were built in 37 and 58, tied to four ocean outfalls that were built between 1937 and 1965. And these ocean outfalls go about a mile to a mile and a half offshore at a depth of 200 feet, and they discharge clean water. And this is water that's typically too salty for reuse, and so we discharge that water into the ocean, which is already salty. Today, we serve about 5.6 million people. The sanitation districts, uh, we serve over half of LA County. We serve 78 of the 88 cities. Um, and we have 24 separate sanitation districts that provide the service. So even though we're a large agency, we're structured in such a way we have local control. Each sanitation district is based on drainage area and um, not political boundaries. And the board of directors of each district is comprised of the mayors or the city council member for each, dis each city within the, uh, a particular sanitation district. We now, in addition to the joint plant in Carson, we have 10 upstream water reclamation plants as far north as Lancaster, Palmdale. We have two in, Adela we have two in Santa Cruz, Saugus and Valencia, as far south as Long Beach. Our so combined, we have 11 wastewater treatment plants. And every day, 
they treat about 400 million gallons of sewage. That's enough sewage to fill the Rose Bowl four or five times a day. So how does that sewage get to one of our treatment plants? Well, it, from your home or your business, the sewage would leave through a, a lateral from your home or business. Then it would go into a local line, either owned by the city or the county. That local line then feeds into one of the sanitation district's trunk sewers. And think of the trunk sewers as large arteries in the body. And those trunk sewers we own and operate, and we're not the county, we're a special district, like a school district. And when the good folks of the South Bay and LA County created the, uh, passed the Sanitation Districts Act, our special district, like a, what, instead of educating kids, it's to manage sewage, to collect and clean sewage so it doesn't wind up in our oceans and our rivers. So then from there, the local line goes into a trunk sewers. We have about 1,400 miles of trunk sewers throughout the county. And this image gives you an idea how big these trunk sewers are. We have some as big as 12 feet and 12 foot in diameter. And you can see, you know, a worker could stand up in the sewer. So we have them all around. And these trunk sewers, they feed to our treatment plants. So today we're going to look at our largest water reclamation plant. This plant gets a higher level of treatment than what the joint plant gets. The joint plant gets primary and secondary treatment. This gets tertiary treatment because what we're trying to do with these water reclamation plant is clean up this water so we can reuse every drop of it. So today we're going to visit San Jose Creek and it's located at the 605 and the 60. As you see here, the 605 freeway and the 60, it's split into an east side, which is currently treating about 32 million gallons per day. And the east side was constructed in the early 1970s. And then 20 years later, we constructed the west side. And it's now treating about 28 million gallons of sewage a day. Combined, the San Jose Creek Water Reclamation Plant treats about 50 million gallons of sewage a day. And it handles the sewage gener generated by about a million people in Covina, South El Monte, La Puente. And today we're going to focus on the east side. This is where our tours, our, our, our physical tours would typically take place. And here's an aerial shot of San Jose Creek East. It's a, it's a tertiary treatment plant. And we're going to, I'm going to repeat some of these concepts. So it has primary treatment, which is just gravity doing its thing. The wastewater will come into these tanks. We slow it down for about two hours. The heavy stuff settles out. The stuff on top, we skim off. Then you have secondary treatment. The wastewater that, that, that leaves those primary tank now has organic material in it, and we feed it into these tanks that have microorganisms, naturally occurring microorganisms. They eat that material, and then they settle out as well after about four to six hours. And then the last step is we put this water through a filter and we disinfect it. This whole process takes 10 to 12 hours, and, and you will see us go through that. So as I mentioned, a tertiary treatment plant and being an engineering technical type organization, we love schematic. So here's the schematic of this San Jose Creek East. So when a trunk sewer comes to our treatment plant, our trunk sewers, like most sewers, are at an angle because we want to gravity flow the sewage to the treatment plant. We don't want to pump it because if we can gravity flow, we save on energy and energy is money. So we save money for us and our rate payers. So this trunk sewer is at an angle, so by the time it gets to our treatment plant, it's way below the ground, and we pump it up into a pump station. Uh, we pump it up to the first level, and it goes through primary treatment where we settle it out. Then the microorganisms do their thing in secondary treatment, and we also we return some of the microorganisms to the front of secondary treatment and waste some. And then the last step is filtration, um, tertiary treatment where we filter it, and we'll get into that in more detail and we disinfect. So let's go on to the show. So here's an actual shot of the influent pump building. So the, the sewage comes into this plant about 30 feet below this building. This is what we call an influent pump building. And here are the pumps inside. And what they do is pump up the sewage to the ground level to these covered tanks, which are the primary tanks. 
and everybody has a drone. So here's a drone shot showing primary tanks. They're about 10 feet in depth. They're all covered to keep odors in. So the sewage came from, the sewage um, um, was pumped up from the influent pump building, then went into the primary tanks and just grab, when you hear primary, just think of gravity, it's just gravity doing its thing. So let's take a look. If we were had the pleasure of walking through the treatment plant, we would flip the lid and this is what you would see on their lid, raw sewage from a million homes. And it's, it's as gross as, in real life, it's as gross as it looks here. Um, and you see this raw sewage that's floating on the, 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 the particles floating on the top. And this is how it wrote, it, the, the primary tanks work. Inside the tanks, there are chains and baffles and they're moving, these paddles are moving. It's skimming the stuff that's settled to the bottom into openings that gets settled out. The stuff that's on top, stuff that's floating on top, it also skims that off. And so during primary treatment, it removes about 60% of the impurities or pollution in wastewater. And all it's doing is letting gravity do its thing. And it's, it's, it's two hours in there and, it, and such a vast improvement in terms of quality of, of water coming in. From there, the water that's left over um, has organic particles that won't settle out or won't sit on the top of the water, but they, they're colloidal particles in nature and organic in nature. So what we do, we send them to secondary treatment, which is a biological process. Here are the secondary tanks. You're looking at our drone shot of them. They're extreme, they're aerated. So there's air bubbling from the bottom of this tank. And what it's doing, it's supporting all these microorganisms that are gonna have a buffet lunch or breakfast on the organic material. So let's take a closer look. So here's a ground level shot of these uh, secondary or uh, tanks or aerated tanks. You can see all the bubbles. At the bottom of these tanks are these round discs that are bubbling oxygen through it. And think of these tanks like a fish tank. If you had a 10 gallon fish tank and there was no oxygen in it or no oxygen bubbling through it, maybe you could only support 10 guppies. But now you bubble oxygen through, now you can support 100 guppies and you have to feed them more and more. That's what we're doing. Now we have trillions of microorganisms that grow in these tanks. We feed them this organic material. We have a lab to make sure our guppies or our microorganisms are healthy because they're the lifeblood of this treatment plant. So they eat this organic material. And after we fed them, we now settle them out. These are our secondary settling tanks. We add some chemicals to help it um, stick together, the microorganisms to stick together or what we call flock and they settle out. So this process, the secondary process, takes about four to six hours. So the primary process takes about two hours and here is about a four, uh, four to six hours. And from there, you get ultra clean, you get very clean secondary effluent. You see it coming over our weirs. But I wanna talk about what happens to the solids. So in the primary step, and the secondary step, we remove solids that, um, that is one of the great savings of sanitation district. So all the solids from San Jose Creek wind up at the joint plant in Carson. Also all the solids from a treatment plant in La Cañada, Pomona, if you live in Pomona, your solids wind up there. We put it, the solids, the wastewater solids back into the sewer. It, it hitches a ride in the sewer system of wastewater that typically is too salty to reuse because there's a high industrial content. And all the solids are taken out at the joint plant Carson. Instead of having solids processing at seven different locations, we get an economy of scale by having at just one location. So the solids, when they get settled out in the joint plant Carson, they get put in what we call anaerobic digester. Here's an aerial shot of those digesters. We have 24 digesters in there. We put that organic solids in there and microorganisms that live in an oxygen-free environment over 15, 16, in some cases, 18 days, break that organic material down and produce methane and CO2. Here's a shot of the digester, is one of the 24. I wanna give you perspective. This is about 10 feet in height. 
and there's another 40 to 50 feet below the ground surface. Here's what it looks like inside a digester. We clean them every eight or nine years. And this is, that board is about a six foot um, long board. So you can get an uh, idea how big these digesters are. So the, so the gas that's produced from those digesters, we generate power from that. So all that, so all the solids that we got in, the, in from um, San Jose Creek and Whittier and Arizona, other treatment plant, it goes into a digester, it produces what we call biogas, and we generate energy from that. We have a 20 megawatt power plant at the joint plant that basically generates enough power to run the treatment plant, that large treatment plant, over 95% of the time. And the only reason I don't say 100% because there are times you have to take it down for maintenance. And let's take a quick look at, at that power plant. We have jet engines that basically use the, the biogas as a fuel to generate um, megawatts. Of, each of these jet engines can generate about nine megawatts. The heat exhaust from this, we have steam generators there that also generate power that we also we generate about four or five megawatts and combined, we generate about 20 megawatts of power at that total, what we call total energy facility. So what happens, so we've taken the gas out of the digesters and after those 16, 17, 18 days, the digested solids are pulled out and they're dewatered because we're gonna take them off site. And when they get pulled out initially, the solids about, the material is about 98% water and 2% solid. And you don't want to have to truck all that to a farm or a composting facility. So we want to dewater that. And so we dewater that using centrifuges. They, the biosolids come in with 98% um, water. And by the time they're done, they're about 70% um, water. And so you can see how a, a typical centrifuge operates. And then from there, we produce wonderful cake. This is what the biosolids looks like after we dewatered it. Um, this is our uh, biosolids or solids processing building. And it looks like chocolate cake. And that's why folks in the industry call it biosolids cake. And from there, the biosolids are trucked to reuse facilities. We have a number of reuse facilities. Bio, everybody wants our water. We have over 950 reuse sites for our recycled water, but biosolids, it's a, we try to reuse it, but it's sometimes it, because of regulation and so on, um, it gets a little um, problematic at times. So we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. So we have a number of biosolids reuse sites. And our most recent one we acquired was Tulare Lake. And that, that site is unique because it's our only biosolids reuse site that we own completely. And we can, uh, we can um, it's always a safety net for us. If, if the other, some of the other sites kind of dry up, we can use that Tulare Lake site. I'll give you a breakdown of how diverse our biosolids management is. You can see the different percentages throughout our you know, in terms of our biosolids uh, portfolio. Genesis, are there any questions? No, there are no questions yet. Okay. Oh, uh, Ricardo Ramirez um, raised his hand, I think. Oh, okay, let me check. I don't see a raised hand here. Actually. No, I think you're good to go, Basil. And so then, the, so, the different reuse sites, we land apply it, and a big thing we do with it is we compost it. Um, at Tulare Lake and some other folks, we, places we compost it with agricultural waste, uh, where we mix the biosolids with farm waste that may have been burned um, to get rid of it in that farming community. And we've improved the air quality by combining the biosolids with ag, ag waste to create a compost, a high quality compost that can be reused as a soil amendment. Oh, actually, Basil, we have one question now. Okay. Actually, two questions. So what about odors? What is that like in the different stages? Oh, that's, um, um, 
because the that's a great question uh, on primary treatment we have the covers that the, the primary tanks are covered so it has no it's under a vacuum so there's minimal odors because of the primary tanks when we saw the aerial flyover um, a lot of treatment plants the primary tank which is the raw sewage is uncovered but here we have our primary tanks covered and they're under vacuum and we pull that air in and we send it we use it as part of anaerobic um, or secondary treatment we bubble it through the secondary tank so we have odors under under control pretty well under control and then we have another question why can the biosolids be composted but i cannot compost waste at home in my in my compost bin um I'm not, I, I'm not sure the answer to that. I mean, I think a lot of people have, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure the answer. Um, and then? I mean, I didn't understand that, why can't, um, I, I guess one of the things I would say is the biosolids that's pulled out after it's been in the digesters for about 17 days, um, six, uh, minimum um, 15, 16 days, it kills most of the pathogens that might be in those biosolids. And that goes into the, and then that's used in a composting process. But I'm not, go ahead. Other questions? Okay. Um, and I th think there was one more about, well, we're going to talk about energy in a bit. So I think the other one was, is everything being reused? What gets released into the ocean from Carson? Okay, so that's a great question. So our upstream treatment plants, um, Pretty much where the, the, the 10 upstream water reclamation plants, pretty much everything is being reused. The plant in Carson, because it has a high concentration in, of industrial waste, um, it has a higher salt content. So historically, it, it, it wasn't cost effective to reuse, but the technologies come around and we're now working with Metropolitan Water District on a project that potentially could reuse about 150 million gallons a day of that water from the joint plant in Carson that's going out to the ocean. And we're in the early stages of that partnership with Met. We've built, uh, with Met, uh, we built a half a million gallon per day demonstration facility on the, the joint plant property. Um, and we're testing, we're collecting data and hope, you know, to get regulatory approval for this process. And Met will do, Metropolitan Water District of Southern California will do environmental documents and then uh, hopefully get their board green light to build a full scale um, purification facility at that treatment plant. Because that joint plant in Carson, our foundational plant, is our last untapped um, water resource. Good. Any other questions, Genesis? Okay, perfect. No, I think, uh, I think we can move on for now. All right, thank you. Um, so, that, so that we just sidetracked to what happens to the solids that come out of San Jose Creek. And one of the benefits of the virtual tour is that we, could have, we got to see what happens to it in the joint plant. In the physical tour, we typically don't see that. So now let's follow this, the flow in terms of the water. So after the water went through the primary, which was set, um, settling, secondary, which is biological process, and you settle those organisms out. Um, now the water that leaves secondary treatment is pretty clean, but now it goes through filters and disinfect, disinfection. So here's an aerial shot of our filters. We have about 20 filters at San Jose Creek. They're about 15 feet deep. And you know, we have a drone to take great footage of this. And here's a close-up of the filter. You can see if this filter has been dewatered. We, we dewater them uh, once in a while. Um, but most of the time, the way we clean them is backwashing them. We, um, they may get clogged over a 24 hour cycle. Uh, let me show you the cross section. The filters have three components they have anthracite, coal, sand, and gravel. The water comes from the top down. And so you have to clean them periodically. And the way we clean them is we we shoot clean water from the top up. It loosens up all the stuff that's clogging the pore space in our filter. And that water, as the filter medium settles back down, that water is sent back to the front of the plant. So it shows you our, um, our filters. 
And after the filters, it goes, it gets disinfected for about an hour and a half and about 10 to 12 hours, you go from raw sewage to essentially drinking water. That water, since 1962, we've been one of the largest um, users of recycled water. We've been recharging um, the local aquifers. This is the Rio Hondo spreading ground. If you go south on the 605 near Pico Rivera, you look to your right, the bodies of water is water from San Jose Creek and it's percolating down into the ground. It's a groundwater table and people have been using it since 1962. So our recycled water augments the local water supply. Since 62, we've recycled over a trillion gallons. We use it for agriculture, industry, landscaping, um, environmental um, situations like uh, lakes and so on. But our biggest use is groundwater recharge. Over 50% of the reuse is groundwater recharge. Recycled water also supports local habitat. So this is an aerial of San Jose Creek. And across the way is the golf course, California uh, Country Club. And they use recycled water from our treatment plant. But let's say they don't need water. We don't have all the takers. We discharge it right into San Jose Creek and it helps support the habitat. And so how do we stack up? You know, we've, we've protected public health and the environment. We're converting waste into a resource. Um, we have, you know, every drop from San, almost every drop from San Jose Creek is spoken for. So how, how, much, how do we compare it to other agencies? So you can see for the joint outfall system, the area that San Jose Creek is in um, and all the, the treatment plants and sanitation districts in the southern part of LA County, um, we're about a little over 20, sewage treatment is about 20 bucks per month. And you compare it to other cities and jurisdictions, you see we're doing quite well, so. And that's all I have. Perfect. Now, are you ready for the questions? I hope so. Drum roll, please. Okay, so we have uh, someone who asked, actually, we have a few questions about, and I told you so. <laughs> no, we have a few questions about uh, flushing medications down the toilet. So someone asked, what happens if people flush medications into the toilet? Oh, Emilio says, amazing presentation. Thank you, thank you, Emilio. Um, but yeah, a few questions about our medications down the toilet. Um, you know, that an area of continuing research, um, we, you know, as we get lower and lower detection limits, we can see trace amounts of um, pharmaceutical medication in the water leaving our treatment plant. Um, and we've seen some changes in like uh, male female ratio to certain aquatic species, but that research is still developing. Um, I think the treatment plant removes most of that medication, but what you can do and um, is to make sure you don't put drugs down the, the drain. People were taught back in the day to flush the medication, um, unused medication, but we don't want that. You can bring it to like we every weekend in Genesis, this is where you can plug your favorite sanitation districts program. My favorite program, the HHW program. It's our household hazardous waste and electronic uh, program. It's we have different roundups throughout LA County every Saturday, including some per permanent ones that the city of LA hosts. But if you go on our website, at, I'll just I'll actually type it in the chats. It's lacsd.org slash HHW. You can find an event near you and you can take um, fluorescent light bulbs, batteries, uh, paints, um, uncont I mean, controlled substances. Uh, am I missing anything? You can take sharps and of course your electronics. So old TVs that you have. I know we were all cleaning up our garages during like the first part of COVID. So any of those electronics, you can definitely take to one of our events free of cost. So if you look in the chat box, I'll put the link on there for you. And you take um, to use medication. It takes you five to 10 minutes um, um, to go through the line typically. And in Genesis, I think there's some uh, medication drop box that if you go to our website, people can find mm -hmm. locations where you can conveniently drop off medication that these medication drop off, right? Yeah. And for the other one, um, let me, I'll put that one too. 
It's lacsd.org slash no drugs down the drain. So if you go, if you visit that link, you'll get sent somewhere else where you can see all these drop off locations near you. And again, this is free of charge uh, to help you get rid of all those, uh, all those medicines that you have. So we have our next few questions, Basil, don't, you can't, you, you can't run away from this. this Let's see. So our next question is, uh, follow up with that. What about the fishes? Do you know the myth? So I'm not sure what myth, but follow up. What about the fishes? Uh, you know, I'm not an expert on it. Um, it's just that in some, some research show that a slight change in the male-female ratio in terms of certain fish population at discharge points in, in certain places. But right. I'm and so this next question is for me, I'll take it. Are these webinars saved? I can see a teacher might be interested in showing this to kids. Yes, uh, we have, we love to do the, a live tour program so that it gives us access to interact with students and, and people. So um, if you have, if you're a teacher or you know a teacher who might be interested in us virtually coming to your classroom, just email us at info at lacsd.org, what you see on the screen. And we'll be happy to set up a virtual tour for you for um, whether it's our water reclamation plant or our landfills. Yeah, because before um, COVID, we were doing uh, how many tours a year for students? Uh, we were doing about 150, I think. Yeah, so, students, yeah. We, we, we think it's very important to um, expose students and you know, and their parents of these concepts, but students are going to replace us in the water and wastewater industry, and we want to make sure you know, they're aware yeah. of the rules and the importance of it. Perfect. So the next question is, um, oh, so someone clarified that. Um, what happens if you flush the fishes down the drain? This is my favorite. This is my favorite one, and, and let me just um, go first a little bit, Basil. My favorite line is when you watch, you know, the beloved and famous Finding Nemo, there's the line in there that says, where they say all drains lead to the, and then they're like, ocean. And so that's, that, that's a lie. That's not true. So Basil, what happens to those fish that we flush down the toilet? Help, help us out. It's not a happy ending. <laughs> it'll be, it'll wind up in the, uh, in the sewer and gravity flow to our treatment plant and, um, it'll be organic material for our microorganisms. So. All right, so now for the harder questions. Is the flow from all the water reclamation plants to Carson all by gravity? So from the, and that, uh, so from our water reclamation plants, what we do is we put the solids that have been settled out from the water uh, reclamation plant and they flow by gravity with sewage all the way to Carson. So it's, it, it's a pretty neat process. I mean, yeah, even from Claremont, the solids will be settled out, just put them back in the sewer, and they, they catch a nice slow ride down to the joint plant in Carson. Okay, great. So for our next question, um, how much does revenue from producing energy on compost offset the expense? Uh, say that again. Um, how much does revenue from producing energy and compost offset the expense? So um, in terms of the, the um, energy side, there's about a $15 million savings, you know, for us and our rate payers. So since it's energy, the joint plant is energy self-sufficient, it's, it's easily $15 million savings in terms of energy uh, usage. In terms of Compost, I'm not sure what that number, but it's in that, you know, it's, but between energy and compost, so you can easily say it's a $16 million saving. And that means that our rates are lower for our rate payers. And that's part of the magic that you saw on that table, that why our rates are so much lower than other folks. We're gravity flowing, and then we're generating energy from this one um, power plant that we call total energy power plant and that's a 15 million dollar savings easily per year great so someone asked well a, a few questions first with our drought and climate change it seems your water should be very valuable 
you mentioned that excess water gets basically dumped. Is that right? Uh, sorry, I was, oh, she says, are you looking for more ways to use the water? I sure could use that on my lawn. Um, so the water that, the untapped source is that joint plant in Carson, our first plant that came on in 1928. But to give you kind of like this wastewater profile, it's like 85% residential and 15% like industrial waste. It has one of the highest concentrations of industry discharging to a regional sewer system. That water until recently, um, we didn't have the technology to cost effectively recycle that. We do now, we think we do now. And so we built with MET, we built a half a million gallon per day purification facility at that joint plant in Carson. It was built, um, I think, October 2019. The, the year seems to fly by when you're in COVID lockup. Um, and we've been collecting data. And over this, two, this next year and a half, we should have enough data to prove up that we can clean up all that water consistently at the joint plant, put it back into our water supply. Um, and at that point, we're also hoping to get um, met on a parallel track will get their board approval. So we're working on that. We, we agree with you. Every drop should be reused. Um, you know, our, our motto is converting waste into resources. I always joke that I'm going to get a tattoo with that, but, <laughs> but I'm scared of needles, so I won't. So, <laughs> so we... <laughs> So we, we have a question that I was hoping for. So thank you, Selena, for asking. Are you possibly collecting data to measure the prevalence of COVID? Um, yes. So there's an area, um, you know, with, you know, so there's an area called wastewater surveillance. So one of the things that sanitation districts is the leader in, um, I think I'm going to have to share my screen again, you know, we have a fantastic lab. They not only make sure our microorganisms are okay are in the secondary treatment, they check to see what's coming into the sewage to make sure toxic material is not in there because it would kill our treatment, the, the microorganism. They also check to see what's going out. So our laboratory folks were ingenious enough to figure out what can they do in these COVID times. So they started analyzing the fragments of the novel coronavirus that come into our wastewater. So I want to share my screen. So if I can do that again. Um, um, Dennis, just tell me if I'm good. Yeah, you're good. Um, All right. So what this is, we've, we've analyzed the, the first thing, the coronavirus is not, is a pretty frail virus. It's basically a, a fat dumpling. You know, it's, and that's why washing your hand will kill this or the soap will break apart that lipid or fat layer and, and pull this thing apart. So people you know, will excrete um, the virus. And once it gets into the sewer, a lot of them are going to be pulled apart because there's soap and, you know, from washing the dishes and laundry and that's wastewater. And then, so, so most of it is, it, it's inactive when it gets to our treatment plant, but we can test for the fragments. And you can see the, the particles that are counted. And what's interesting, you know, and it's, we're sharing these, this data with, we're working with universities and health officials, and we're providing this data, and hopefully they can provide some insight where we are in terms of overall uh, community infection. And if you notice, let's go to the next one. These, uh, these two curves are from um, our joint plant, Carson and San Jose Creek that you just looked at and you're looking at the wastewater that's generated by 5 million people and as the fragment counts go up like right here you'll notice two weeks later the number of cases in LA County go up and if you go further you do the same thing the number of hospitalization when the when our fragment counts go up it's a leading indicator about two weeks out of what you're going to see in the hospital so, but you can see um, that our counts are going down. So it seems like everyone's kind of doing the right thing and taking heed that, you know, you know, physical distance and so on. So we're doing our part. We're collecting data to try to help characterize the, the level of, um, you know, of infection in the community. Did I answer that question, Genesis? 
I'm going to stop sharing now. Any other questions, Genesis? Yeah. So the next question is, when it rains hard in LA, do we sometimes hear that the we sometimes hear that the excess water causes overflow issues in the sewer system. I thought street drains could go straight into the ocean. Um, yeah, so street dra drains do go, uh, storm drains into ocean, but what happens when streets are really flooded, like in uh, spring of 2017, um, some uh, manhole covers are popped because people don't want their homes and property flooded out, and it leads to inflow into our treatment plant. Um, the joint plant in Carson in 20, in January of 2017 um, came within um, a foot of flooding out because there's such, you know, we're seeing such swings in weather. I mean, um, you get intense rainfall and, it, and in 2017, it all, almost overwhelmed the, the joint plant because of all the water coming in through the manholes that were opened up. Great. So our next question is, um, how many employees do we have? Uh, sanitation districts, you know, we, we do wastewater. We, we, have, we have 11 wastewater treatment plants, treat 400 million gallons of sewage a day. We also handle solid waste. So combined, we have about 1,600 um, employees, engineers, uh, chemists, public affairs specialists like Genesis, accountants, uh, clerical staff heavy equipment operators, it takes, you know, a team. Everybody has a role to play. So the number? 1,600 employees. Perfect. Um, our next question, what is groundwater recharge? That's a good one. Okay, so that's just basically you take that water that's been cleaned up, you put it on the soil, and it percolates through the soil to where it gets down into the groundwater table. And then someone then downstream can uh, punch a well in there and pull that water out. So just basically put it on the ground, percolate down through the ground until it gets into the aquifer of the groundwater table. Because we're pulling water out from wells around LA County, you have to replenish it and we're helping replenish it. So. Mm -hmm. um, all right, we have a lot of good questions coming up. So now someone's interested in our uh, solid waste. So oh. what happens to solid waste that goes to landfill, landfills? Is there a similar presentation about landfills? You can answer that, Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, we have, uh, we have a similar presentation that's dedicated to our solid waste management and every, all the recyclables and what goes to our landfills. Um, we, you can request that tour we can, again we can gladly go if you have a group we can we can go and give you a virtual tour of our solid waste management side so that's the same i'll type it in the chats actually too so you can email us if you're interested in the solid waste um in our solid waste tours or you can also i think on social media we've posted the links to our youtube account and i think on our youtube account we have uh a video of our um, solid waste virtual tour and I think um, also on our website, if you go to the list of our virtual tour, if you missed the tour, we have the YouTube um, recording on the site. So if you go to, so we had the solid waste um, virtual tour, I can't even remember, July? On July 11. Yeah. And so if you go to our website and you click on the link, you will see me stumbling around talking about solid waste. <laughs> but um and me laughing but you so i just put the link on the chats for our tours page so you'll see there's one for july 11th if you click on that it'll open up the the link to to the solid waste tours um next question i've sometimes seen landscapes with signs stating brown water not to drink that water because it's recycled water does that water come from one of these treatment plants I'm not, usually when you see our water, you see purple pipes. Yeah, purple pipes. Yeah, purple pipes. Um, and um, yeah, and so maybe that's what you're talking about. And typically, we, uh, they're told, people are told not to drink it. Um, but chemically, it's safer than water billions of people drink every day. Um, but in California, in the United States, we have a much higher standard. So, um, But it, as we complete, if we get to complete that full scale, purification facility at the joint plant, you can drink it. That won't be an, an issue. So 
It's essential drinking water, but in California, you're not allowed to drink it. Okay. Perfect. Um, so the next question is, uh, what are some of the current challenges, such as climate change, that are affecting the sanitation systems? Challenges? Um, I think uh, um, aging infrastructure. I mean, a lot of this infrastructure, you know, the joint plant was built in 28. The tunnels were built in, you know, 37 and 58. And we haven't, ha we haven't built a new tunnel since that point. So I think uh, um, aging infrastructure. Also, um, I guess that's part of aging workforce. That's why we do these two school tours. So kids get into math and science and so on to replace us. Um, I also think that, um, uh, well, for Southern California, one of the big issues is also stormwater. Um, we've done a great job with wastewater. In the 1920s, wastewater was a big issue. Now, I would say the biggest water issue is how to handle stormwater, and we're trying to play a role in that. So when we were created in 23, we were a wastewater agency. In the 50, our act was amended to help out in solid waste because there was a big solid waste issue because people used to burn their solid waste back then. Well, our act was again recently amended um, to allow us to help cities um, develop stormwater management plans. So our, our uh, skilled staff is here to work with cities to come up with stormwater management um, solutions. Um, and we've, I think we're working with the city of Carson. We worked as uh, we helped the city of Carson develop uh, a stormwater management project that's coming online pretty soon. And I guess, is it just on wastewater side? Because on the solid waste side, um, it's what do you do with organics that are going in the landfill? A lot of cities are facing um, issues that they have to divert organics. And so we have a food waste energy program. And this is a shameless plug for next week's tour where we're gonna talk about how we're taking food waste and turning it into energy. Same time next week, same bat channel. Yeah, food waste, uh, tour on your food waste um, next week, Saturday at 9 a.m. There's another question that I want to get out of the way right now. Do we have to pay for the tour? No, all of our tours are free, completely 100% free. So you can attend all our tours, one of our tours, whatever you like, they're, they're free of charge. Um, so the next, did you want to drink some water or something fast? <laughs> You're good? No, I'm, I'm good. Okay. I'll do that. All right. Cause I got a good one for you. Uh, Are you monitoring PFAS or PFOA? Yes, we have a committee. We, we've been monitoring PFAS and PFOA. Um, yeah, so we are, we are monitoring that. We're looking at that. Um, yeah, so we are, we are monitoring that. And I'm not an expert on that, but we are monitoring that. And we have um, scientists and engineers working on that, characterizing that. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, okay, yeah. Um, are all treatment plants alike in the US, elsewhere? I, I, I think most, I, I think Cal and the nation, all treatment plants have to be, I think, with the Clean Water Act, minimally secondary treatment. So that primary step where you use the solids, um, solids are settled out using gravity, and a secondary treatment, which is a biological process where microorganisms eat the organic material and settle out. I think that's a, that's a national minimum standard, minimum standard. And here in Southern California, I'm not sure, the tertiary level, we do it because it's a valuable resource. Um, you know, it augments our water supply instead of having to import water in with our population, about 10 million people in LA County, you have this water supply to, to help us out. Um, great, now we, we wanna get a little personal for a bit. What is your background? Tell us more about Basil Hewitt. How do you prepare for work with the sanitation districts? You really wanna know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a civil engineer. Give um, the people what they want. I'm a nerd and I don't know, I, I enjoy what I do. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the next tour is, um, and so your background, you, you studied civil engineering? Civil engineering, um, yeah, at Rutgers. Masters in what? Masters in environmental engineering at Loyola Marymount. And, uh, okay, great. And then, um, so, oh, so, so we have another environmental engineering grad from Canada. 
Oh, so, and I'm from Jamaica originally. I thought I was going to go back to Jamaica and work there, or at least in the Caribbean. Yeah. And I got a job with the districts, and I love Southern California and the agency. You know. That's perfect. And I was just teasing you. It was a, it was a general question. So for me, I, I studied at economics, and I majored in communications. Um, I really love the communication side of it, and I wanted to use the economic backgrounds to help me. So I loved the, the district's mission and what it was about. Thankfully, I, I got hired, and from there, I, I've learned so much, so much, and that's, that's how I got started. Um, so the next one is uh, from Elka. I'm a little confused about what liquids end up being discharged into the pipes you showed at the beginning versus reusing the gray water. Okay, so the water that goes in the pipe, it looks like, it, it looks like tap water. Um, but what happens, the pipes that go out to the ocean, but they have a higher salt concentration. So that's water that went to the plant in Carson. The plant in, in San Jose Creek, that water is cleaned up and put back into the community. So if you can think of different um, tributary areas to the treatment plant, the water that uh, mainly that like Carson and some of those other communities that directly gravity flow to that joint plant. It, like I said, there's a high concentration of industry. And at this point, we can't really, um, no pun intended, tap into that water because of salt content. So that gets discharged, that salt water gets discharged to discharge of the salty ocean. No harm, no, no foul. But we're trying to remove that salt cost effectively and reuse that. The upstream treatment plant, so what they're taking is mainly residential flow. And instead of cleaning that water all up in, in Carson and then pumping it back uphill, it made more sense when they were mapping out the sanitation district treatment plant to have the treatment plant, at, like San Jose Creek is at the 605 and the 60, to have it there in that where the wastewater is generated, wastewater from like Covina, La Puente, South Del Monte, you get it there, you clean it up there, and then it's not a, a long leap to put it back into parks or, or Rio Hondo spreading ground, if that clears up. So out of the 400 million, um, like 260 go down to Carson, and the other 140 or go up to are in that other uh, 10 wastewater treatment plant. If that You're muted, Genesis. Sorry, is there any legislation that originates in the 1920s that stimulated the creation of the wastewater treatment program for the region? Um, the Sanitation District Act. That, that almost feels like a softball question. So um, back, I mean, the first, we have 24 sanitation districts. The first, our first sanitation district was in the South Bay. It's called, and it's still there now. It's called South Bay um, the City Sanitation District. Back in the 1920s, those Manhattan Beach, Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach, those beaches were really fouled by sewage coming mainly from the city of LA's Hyperion treatment plant. And so the folks there got with their um, state legislator and they crafted a law that became the Sanitation District Act and our agency was formed from that legislation. So. Perfect, all right, here's a harder one for you. Actually, it's, is a good bacteria that is introduced during digestive phase carry over to the cake phase, thereby creating a healthy compost containing healthy bacteria? Um, the bacteria, the, any pathogens, and I'm not, the pathogens that could be harmful, most of them, uh, they're destroyed during in the, in the digestion process. So it shouldn't be, and yeah, and then furthermore in the composting process. So does this mean that all of our wastewater that's put into the systems in the end can be turned into drinkable water? And why is some drinkable water and others not? Um, the big issue is salts and in, I think all wastewater can be turned into drinkable water. And that's what we're trying to prove now with the joint plant, the water that goes to the joint plant in Carson. It's probably one of the things that we're putting a lot of thought and effort in is to clean that water up and if so i think all wastewater can be cleaned up and be put back in the water supply um so what is the level of 
pathogenic bacteria in the different stages? Is there a concern about being exposed at any point from start to finish? Yes, definitely. So as you, if you work in a treatment plant, there's uh, personal protective equipment that you must wear, you have to wear. Um, and, and our operators, men and women, they're, 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 they follow those guidelines because in that treatment plant, you know, if, you know, the San Jose Creek um, handles wastewater generated about a million people. Someone, there are people that are ill in that population. And so it could be hepatitis, dysentery, you name it, it's in there. And the treatment process kills those microorganisms, stops that process. So our operators know, you know, when, you know, to, you know, wear personal protective equipment and, you know, and be cautious. So. Okay. Great. And this one is right up your alley. Do you have references for the history of waste management for this region? Are there any books or articles that you would recommend? Um, well, one of the books I read is, was the narrative, or, and that just really says how nerdy I am. Um, <laughs> our, our second chief engineer, um, he was with the agency from its formation in 1923 until um, he retired um, in 1958. And in the 60s, he wrote a history of the sanitation district. So I read that. And then there's a book um, called Brown Acres by, um, I think her name is Anna Scalar. It's a paperback book. And it's, I think it was commissioned by the LA Historical Society. And I've read it and it's a, it's a, it's, oh, yeah. it's really good. Um, so if you really want to see the history of wastewater in, in, in Los Angeles County, in Southern California, I, I recommend, and I don't own any rights to the book, but I That's thought- a, you want, You're not making commission? Yeah. All right, so I, I just looked it up. It's called Brown Acres, An Intimate History of the Los Angeles Sewers by Anna Scalar. So uh, if, if you're interested, you can look it up on Google and it's on Amazon too, I think. Yeah, it's on Amazon. It's, it's a thin book, but yeah. it's pretty good. Okay, perfect. Um, Another question, you may have said this, but how much of the wastewater is reclaimed or recycled for use in everyday life? So, yeah, so out of the, yeah, so out of the upstream treatment plants, pretty much, I think we're recycling, I want to say about 90 million gallons to 100 million gallons per day. With conservation, I'm not sure what those numbers are, but 80 to 90 million gallons a day but our, our flows are going down a little bit as people conserve more. So about 90, let's say 90 to 100 million, and then you got 260 or so on going to the joint plant, which we're trying to reuse. So let's say 90 to 100 million gallons, is, it, it's being roughly being re reused. Okay. Sanitation district. Perfect. Um, so another one, great presentation. <laughs> Does the clean water recharge the aquifer in only one specific location close to the treatment plant, or is the clean water transported to multiple areas? Um, the, the Rio Hondo spreading grounds, and I think it flows down great into like Long Beach. So, um, and yeah, so that's the big groundwater recharge I'm aware of. Um, if the one at the joint plant comes to fruition, that would go into four different aquifers. Um, that's the that's the plan at this point okay so we have two questions regarding water desalination plants um is water recycling process less expensive than water desalination are there plans for desalination plants do we need them uh i can't answer the second one i'll just the first question it is less expensive it's just simply um what we have salts in the water and 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 the joint plant the plant in carson but the salt concentration is much less than the salt concentration in ocean water, seawater. So you're going to need, it's almost proportional, you're going to need much less energy to remove the salt in our wastewater than to remove the salt in seawater. So the more, because um, the, the purification process we're looking to build full scale, it requires a lot of energy we're going to use what we call microfiltration and reverse osmosis. And just simply what reverse osmosis is, is you take this water and you're forcing it through the, this, this filter, the fine pour. So it's going to take a lot of energy and you clean water will come out the other side. So the less stuff you have to, um, the less salt you have in the water is the less 
expensive, less energy you're going to need. Okay. Not a game in town. At, at this point, Basil, I feel like you're paying these people to ask you great questions because this next one is definitely right up your alley. Um, you mentioned aging infrastructure as a challenge. Are there plans for upgrading this infrastructure? And if so, are there funding sources for that work? Um, so the most critical part of our infrastructure in terms of our regional wastewater management system were those two tunnels um, that I showed you early on, kind of setting the stage. It was like the, the mothership for all our treatment plant. But those tunnels haven't been out of uh, service since 50, 58. So we, we're building a new tunnel now that we call the Clearwater Tunnel. And it's going to, it should be done, construction started uh, last year, but it will be done in 2026. And at that point, we'll have some redundancy. We'll have new infrastructure um, in terms of um, the back end of the joint plant. And then also with our sewers, we have a routine, we have a maintenance system or we have a sewer maintenance group that um, is always uh, putting cameras, the CCTV cameras in our sewer. And they're on minimally a five year cycle. If we think there could be problems, a quicker cycle where we're always checking these sewers to make sure that there's not crown rot or some problem structurally. Because some of these sewers have been in the ground since 1928, 1932. You know, it's like driving a car that, you know, at some point you got to check what's under the hood. So we have an extensive um, monitoring or maintenance system. And then in terms of funding, um, you know, this is, you know, back in the day, I mean, especially when Clean Water Act passed and I wasn't back then, there, there was a lot of federal funding for it where they gave you grant money. Now what we what we tend to take a, avail ourselves of to help our rate payers, we try to get um, low interest loans from the state and the Fed. So if something costs $50 million, we can spread it out over a 30 year period and they, they have um, incredibly low interest rates. Um, so, okay. and, and then if we don't get those, and then the funding source to pay off those loans, if you are, if you're hooked to the sewer system, you own property that's hooked to the sewer system, you pay an annual uh, sewer service charge um, for own operation and maintenance. And if you're hooking up for the first time, you buy into the system and you pay like a connection fee. So those are the funding sources. Um, I would say 90% of our funding comes from ratepayers, and then a small portion comes from taxes. That felt a little confusing. Okay, just, just a little, but I think we, we got the answer. Um, are there any biohazard concerns with the biosolids? Um, none that I'm aware of. I mean, biohazard. I mean, I guess I could talk all day about the districts and, you know, we, we don't want to do that because NFL starts tomorrow. But uh, um, one of the things, so industrial waste, we have an industrial waste section where um, we have inspectors. So if you have an industry that wants to discharge the sewer, we'll have inspectors and engineers meet with that industry and make sure there's pretreatment of stuff that could create a biohazard for us, the plant or the environment. So stuff that could be a biohazard is not put into the sewer. It's removed before from that industrial wastewater before it hits our sewer system. Okay, great. So we're a few questions. Um, if someone wanted to use these videos to if someone like for teaching and use them in their own distance learning Zoom sessions with students. Could they do that? Could they just use our YouTube videos? For sure, definitely, yeah. Although I, I would say I, I'm very biased. I prefer the live Zoom sessions so that if your students have questions, they can ask us directly. Um, but you know, if, if you wanna do it on your own with your own class, you can definitely look us up on YouTube and uh, use one of our videos that we have there. I sure. only request a Photoshop make me look like Denzel. Yeah, that would be hard. <laughs> so then, and I think we have, um, oh, and the teacher said, I prefer seeing you all in person as well. Thank you. Um, 
So the next question is, is recycled water approved for use in the making of consumer products? I recently saw baby wipes stating that they are treated with triple treated water. That sounds like recycled water. The box even had purple printing on the box. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, there, California, there's a Title 22 that tells you the different uses of recycled water depending on the level of treatment. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I don't think, I think you can use it. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard that, that much about, that much about it. Um, and I think that that's it. Those are all our questions for the day. Um, everyone's just, just saying thank you. Um, I think we're done with all our questions. So if we have no further questions, then we will conclude. That concludes today's presentation of. Do you have something else to plug? For next uh, What's the next one? Oh, make sure you go to our food waste tour next week, next Saturday at 9 a.m. Um, it, it's really cool. You kind of learn about uh, the new legislation where California is requiring businesses to divert Thanks. food waste from landfills. And we're going to be talking about what we're doing to help businesses and, and cities help uh, recycle that food waste. So it's actually really cool. It's one of the, the first times that we're going to do an official virtual presentation for it. So we've been taking a lot of footage um, and we have a lot of nice loads of food waste that come in. So please, um, please join us next week at, um, at 9 a.m. September 19th, 9 a.m. Tell a friend. And tell a friend, yeah, and, and come on over. It'll be a party. Um, so now people are asking about this presentation. Um, it will get posted on our YouTube site um, if you want to check out our YouTube, just type in Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts um, and you'll see, you'll see the presentation get updated. So I think we should have it, um, I would say, by like Wednesday or Thursday of next week so that, you know, we, we give time to edit the, the video and make sure it's the right specifications and, and, and such. He's going to overdub me so I sound smart. Right? Yeah. Um, so perfect. Um, if you guys have, is there any way of getting signing up for notifications of upcoming presentations? No, we, we don't have like an official sign up list, but what we do have is on our social media, we're plugging them all the time. So if you follow us on Facebook, on Twitter or Instagram, um, we're, we're literally posting all of our upcoming tours. We'll even put a reminder a week before, days before. So if you follow us on social media, that, that's a perfect way of, of, of knowing when our next tours are. But anyway, thank you guys so much for, for coming over. We were glad to be here. And thank you, Genesis. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And enjoy the rest of your weekend. And hopefully we'll see some of you or hear from some of you next week.